Hi, my name is Tony. Hi, my name is Daniel. Um, our project focuses on throwing in Drake. Uh, so we wanted to build a robot capable of tossing objects to a desired target location. Um, by tossing an object, a robot can expand the range of poses to which it can manipulate an object, which is particularly useful for stationary robots that do not have a mobile platform on which to navigate through space. For our project, we drew a lot of inspiration from a recent work, Tossing Bot, by Andy Zhang and co at Google. Here we show our robot successfully tossing a small ball represented by the purple sphere into bins at predefined target locations. We'll first show the robot tossing it into a bin at a distance of 4.5 meters, then 7.5 meters, and 1.5 meters from the origin. Our throw consists of a predefined pick motion, movement to a waypoint that clears the bin, and then joint interpolation to a pre-throw pose. The joints of interest are then moved at a constant velocity to a post-throw position. During that trajectory, the gripper will release the object. So in addition to being able to throw at targets at z equals zero, we can also throw to targets that are located very low, like this one, as well as targets uh, that are located very high, like this one here. Our first attempt at getting the robot to throw was to define a trajectory in end effector space marked by that arc of poses you see on the screen. And then the robot would attempt to move along that trajectory and release exactly halfway along it. If the robot does this perfectly, then the throw should be perfect. But as you can see, that throw was pretty bad. In fact, if we look closer here, the robot's throw is not even straight. In other words, the throw is not true. And the reason for this is because the joints can't instantaneously accelerate to the velocity we tell them to accelerate. That lag causes the entire motion to be off. In response to these problems, we noticed with the original throwing algorithm. We decided to go back to the drawing board and look at how the robot moves around and try and find a way that we can get the robot to throw in a completely straight line. So the key observation we had was if we only move joints four and joints six, the motion of the end effector will stay completely on one line or within the same plane. Looking down like the negative x-axis right here, you can see that the end effector is always staying within that axis. And that's actually exactly what we want because we want throws to stay on one plane and not fall left or right to a different heading. The other key thing that we noticed was if we just rotate joint one, we can tell the robot to throw in any direction radially outwards from the robot face. So our algorithm that we use later on just consists of movement purely between joints one, four, and six. Well, during the throwing, it's just joints four and six. Then we'll go to a specific joint one pre-throw to determine what direction we're throwing in. So once we set joint one's angle, the problem essentially reduces down to a 2D problem. And we can model this as trying to hit a target point x, y, um, and have our projectile land at some angle theta. And everything in blue here is kind of the input to our algorithm. So you might be wondering why we need to specify both the position and the angle of landing. The reason is if we don't specify the angle of landing, the ball can bounce off the side of the bin. The job of our algorithm is then to generate two parameters, tau and lambda. Uh, tau represents the time interval in which the throw motion occurs, um, and lambda represents kind of the fraction along that throw at which we release the ball. So given tau and lambda, we can use forward kinematics and simple projectile motion physics to calculate two quantities y hat and theta hat. And y hat and theta hat, what they represent is uh, where the ball is projected the land if we follow the throw plan specified by tau and lambda. So here again, x, y is the target point. At the moment our ball reaches the x coordinate of the target, what is its projected y value? And that's y hat and its projected angle of approach is theta hat. Then to solve for the appropriate throw parameters, we just solve the following optimization problem. We minimize over our, the parameters we can control, tau and lambda, and we minimize this sum of square error term where the minimum of zero means that we perfectly hit the target position at the desired angle. Now, delving a little bit deeper into this forward kinematics, the motion of our throw is actually predefined. So we have initial joint angles for the, for the throw motion and final joint angles for the throw motion. 
and we just linearly interpolate between these two. At any given time t, our joint angles look something like this. Then Drake makes it very easy to do forward kinematics to compute the spatial position of the end effector given the joint angles. And in order to get the release velocity, all we have to do is take a derivative of this. Drake also has a nice method to compute this, which is calc Jacobian spatial velocity. On this plot, we can see uh, a plot of both the actual joint Stirner simulation as well as our planned joint Stirner simulation. So one thing that we noticed pretty soon was that our plans don't actually match what happens in simulation. So our plans assume that we can instantaneously make the joint start moving, which actually doesn't isn't really possible. So based on these these profiles for the blue and orange lines here, we can see that in simulation and in reality, the robot uh, joints will actually slowly accelerate up to the target velocity. And we see this kind of ramp up period right here and right here. The problem with this motion is that our original plan gripper, as shown by this pink line here, was to release the object at this time point. So if there's a vertical line here. We wanted to release it here, but it's actually being released here. So the robot hasn't actually moved as far as we wanted it to move. To resolve this issue, we implemented a simple closed loop controller that only opens the gripper once the robot arm hits the desired position for release. The output of the closed loop controller is shown in red. So it turns out our throwing algorithm takes a little bit of tuning in order to get it to throw accurate. And one of the reasons that we need to tune the throw is that the projectile actually slightly slips in our grip during the throw motion. On the left image is uh, the initial position of the ball in the gripper. And on the right image is the position of the ball right before we release it. And we can see it's slightly slipped in our grip, which means our physics calculations, which are based on the initial position, are off. Our algorithm assumes that we have a good estimate of the object's center of mass. When the object slips, we actually will calculate the Jacobian at the wrong pose and we'll have a wrong estimate of the object's velocity at release time. This could affect the trajectory of our throw to be not where we actually want it to go. During the process of preparing some of our demo videos, we imported a mesh that was way too large for the actual object that was being tossed, as shown here. So this fastball is actually orders of magnitude larger than the tiny little sphere, the little purple sphere that we've been throwing earlier in the previous videos. So the collision physics, we're still using the purple sphere, but the visualization, we have this huge ball here. So while this was a little bit of an accident, it actually showed us a lot about what's going on between the gripper and the ball during our throwing motion. So as the robot is moving, right now we see it stationary, but as it moves to the pre-throw position, we can see that the, the ball actually spins quite a bit, suggesting that the object is actually not really stationary and there are external forces or forces from the gripper that are acting upon it, which kind of emphasizes to us that we don't actually know the exact physics of what's going on between that gripper and ball interface. Some future directions that we think would be interesting to explore would be one, incorporating adaptive control. This would allow us to estimate, for instance, the center of mass of the object we're picking up just by feeling its weight as the robot moves around. We could also incorporate learning. This would allow us to adjust to any quirks of the simulator. For our project, we assume perfect knowledge of the object pose and a predefined pose that we would like to grasp the object at. In any real world situation though, we would likely be estimating the object's pose through a perception system, likely consisting of RGBD input. Using visual information, we could then also try to learn other features of the objects. For example, grasps, uh, grasp poses or grasp quality scores, which is something that many other recent works have done. Um, at some point, we'd also be curious to try our system on a real robot. Um, this may not actually be super safe, but we'd be curious to see how actually the sim, the sim to real transfer is. <laughs> cool. And then we want to thank all the course staff for all their help during this semester. Um, we really appreciate it. It's been a really cool class, especially during COVID. Um, thanks to Russ for putting this course together. And thanks to Mung and Terry for all your late night Slack help. We really appreciate it. And this project wouldn't be possible without all of your help. As a finale, we would like to show our robot making a regulation MBA 3.0. So we're going to see if our robot can make the shot. Please enjoy the show. Each team has a foul to give as we come up on a minute remaining. And they're putting Curry in the pick and roll, trying to get him on Irving. Defense! Defense! Irving and Curry, one on one. Irving puts it up. It's good. Kyrie Irving from downtown. And the Cavaliers by three.